England's rise. Since they were islanders, it shouldn't come as a major shock that a good portion of the English knew their way around a boat. But what truly set the English apart from Europe's many other maritime cultures was the body of water those boats had to deal with. The bulk of English life resides in the southeastern quadrant of Great Britain, in the general vicinity of the Thames River. The Thames provided all of the unification and local trade opportunities of Europe's other rivers, but it empties into the North Sea, one of the world's most dangerous bodies of water, frigid, tidal extreme, and storm-wracked. There is no day where you dare bring your B-game on the North Sea. As the Spanish discovered in 1588 when it wrecked over half their armada in their failed invasion of England. The severity of the North Sea is the quintessential example of why it took so long for humans to master the oceans, and it was in this crucible that the English naval tradition was forged. Navies offer a flexibility that no land-bound powers can match, and their especially skilled and potent navy gave the English an unmatched advantage in the European competition for supremacy. England's maritime acumen enabled it to nimbly switch trade partners at will, keeping it an economic step ahead of all competitors. Its navy let it land forces at the times and places of its choosing, keeping it a military step ahead of all competitors. And its ability to easily relocate military and economic pressure made it the ally of choice for any European power that it was not currently in conflict with. And that was before the English learned the Iberian secrets of deepwater navigation. With deepwater technologies, England leveraged its superior maritime acumen onto the global stage. Bit by bit, the better skilled English navy reached out across the world and seized control of the Iberian trade network. Between 1600 and 1800, South Asia and the Far East were removed forcibly from the Portuguese sphere of influence. English colonies steadily supplanted their competitors at key locations in Gambia, Nigeria, South Africa, Diego Garcia, India, Singapore, and Hong Kong, relegating the time of Portuguese greatness to history. The faster and more maneuverable vessels of the English allowed them to raid deep into the pool. colonies on security lockdown and to assign naval assets to protect convoys. It quickly became obvious that the only locations the Spanish would be able to derive long-term income from were those that they had directly colonized with populations sufficient to resist English attacks. In response, the English founded a series of their own colonies in the New World to start the ball rolling on a demographic overthrow of Spanish power in the Western Hemisphere. The most lasting impact of the Deepwater Revolution, however, wasn't the shifting of the spice trade, the fall of the Ottomans, or even the rise of the English or British Empire. It was the transformation of the ocean from a death sentence to a sort of giant river. Deepwater navigation cracked the world open, launching the Age of Discovery, which in turn condensed the world both culturally and economically. Ships capable of making round-the-world voyages made every significant culture aware of the others. Those ships' cargo capacity enabled every previously sequestered river valley to trade with all of the others. Interaction, whether peaceful or hostile, trade or war, was no longer local, but global. It was an age custom-built for a culture as maritime-oriented as the English, and they crafted an empire greater in reach or wealth than any that preceded them. They emerged as the dominant global power, able to impose economic and military realities on cultures as varied as Northern Europe, Southern China, the Indian subcontinent, and throughout the Arab world. Just as the Ottomans had done before them, the English seemed likely to extend their mastery of the seas and globe-spanning empire into something permanent. But they failed too. Just as with sedentary agriculture and deepwater navigation, a new suite of technologies changed the rules of how the world worked. Ironically, the technologies that ended English dominance were homegrown. As an island nation, the English didn't have need for as potent an army as the mainland empires, so the crown of England was not as absolute as the Iberian monarchies. There were many interests, political, economic, and even military, that coexisted with the government. When the time came for the English to start challenging the Iberian imperial systems, State assets alone were insufficient to the task. The crown had to mobilize not just its own forces, but the forces of its various aristocrats and businessmen as well. 
royal dispensation was granted to a variety of private players, the most famous of which was the East India Company, launched in 1600, to pursue various interests for the greater good of the English nation. When the profits from English successes started flooding home, they didn't just go to the royal coffers, but also found their way into the pockets of any number of stakeholders, and each used the newfound financial resources in his own way. Unlike the Iberian monarchs, the English businessmen saw more in the wider world than just spices and precious metals. They also saw bottomless markets. The English system, therefore, didn't seek just simple plunder but also to develop a global trade system with England at the center. Unlike deep water navigation, which developed in response to the economic need, industrialization was an outgrowth of opportunity. The diverse interests of the English system, the sudden and continuous onrush of wealth that came from the expanding empire, and the still building shift from superstition and tradition to reasoning and scientific inquiry that began with the Renaissance, led to a new sort of technological revolution an industrial revolution. Industrialization 1. Manufacturing a New World In the pre-industrial world, everything had to be powered by muscle, wind, or water. That is a trifecta of restrictions on the human condition. Work could only be done where there was muscle, wind, or water to be had, and then only to the degree that the muscle, wind, or water could support it. Most important, you couldn't just import muscle, wind, or water to a location that had none. A civilization wouldn't take root or flourish without being able to support a population of sufficient size. That largely eliminated desert, steppe, jungle, and mountain climates from approaching the degree of wealth and development that the Europeans had achieved. Deep water navigation vastly reduced long-haul transport costs and allowed the European empires to nibble at the edges of this problem a bit. But at the end of the day, it was still a contest between areas with easily navigable waterways. The world's marginal lands, which is to say most of the rest of the planet, remained as undeveloped and untamed as ever. Industrialization technologies brought with them the potential to change all that.